Hello, You Can Heal family. I am here and ready to get into this wonderful <laughs> book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. My day's been full and I'm just sitting down. It's just before 9 p.m. I'm getting ready to read the Bible and it just reminds me of how busy our days can be and just how... <laughs> It's like the end of the night and I'm just reading the word, but that, that, that was my life today and it was busy. We went to church this morning and I walked, I walked for like an hour this morning and then got ready for church and then after that I had a nap. I did. I had to sleep and then I had to take the girls shopping. Blessing needed new volleyball shoes and things like that. So anyways, that's that's just kind of what was going on in my life today. If you were wondering, you know, what happened to this good reading earlier in the day or in the morning and what happened to 7 a.m., oh my goodness. So fall is here, school starts here for my kids on Wednesday. And I've got to get my routine down, right? Because <laughs> it just gets so busy just preparing for back to school. And, and all the activities so anywho that's that was my day I hope you had a wonderful one and um, I hope you're ready to hear what the Lord has for us so we're going to be reading Revelation uh, chapter 15 and 16 and I think after tonight we'll have three more nights in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ and we will um, have completed the entire New Testament and then we'll just you know, see what the Lord puts on my heart to do, to bring, you know, what am I trying to say? What the Lord will show me that we should be reading together with the Read With Me. So that's just where we are. All right. So you can heal family. Let's get to it. And Tracy Ann, I'm so thankful for all your good comments and just um, taking this journey with me. So let's get to it. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, Chapter 15. Preparation for the Bold Judgment. Then I saw in heaven another significant event, and it was great and marvelous. Seven angels were holding the seven last plagues, which would bring God's wrath to completion. I saw before me what seemed to be a crystal sea mixed with fire. How beautiful. A crystal sea mixed with fire and on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. They were all holding harps that God had given them and they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. So it looks like this is the song because it's indented in parentheses and it says great and marvelous are your actions Lord God Almighty just and true are your ways O King of Nations who will not fear O Lord and glorify your name for you alone are holy all nations will come and worship before you for your righteous deeds have been revealed Verse 5 says, Then I looked and saw that the temple in heaven, God's tabernacle, was thrown wide open. The seven angels who were holding the bowls of the seven plagues came from the temple, clothed in spotless white linen, with gold belts across their chest. And one of the four living beings handed each of the seven angels a gold bowl filled with the terrible wrath of God, who lives forever and forever. The temple was filled with smoke from God's glory and power. No one could enter the temple until the seven angels had completed pouring out the seven plagues. So now I'm going to go ahead and read the commentary. They have commentary for verses 5, 6, and 7. So let's see what that's all about. The tabernacle which is in bold reads, was built by Moses as a dwelling place for God. It contained the Ark of the Covenant, 
which held the stone tablets on which were inscribed the Ten Commandments. So uh, most people know the Ten Commandments. So those were contained in the Ark of the Covenant. And there's a note to see Exodus 25, 10 through 7. The symbolism suggests that God himself is judging those who have violated his law. Clothed in linen is in bold and it reads, like the priest who served God. Yeah, the fine linens. Now let's go back and see what Exodus 25 verses 10 through 27, because it said um, the stone tablets were inscribed on the Ten Commandments. On the, which, oh my gosh, the Ark of the Covenant, which held the stone tablets, tablets on which were inscribed the Ten Commandments. So let's, let's turn to Exodus chapter 25 verses 10 through 27 i know where exodus is so this shouldn't take me that long exodus 25 okay 10 through 27 so i'm at 25 okay so now there's a whole section here in exodus chapter 25 that is entitled the ark of the covenant so let's read this and get a little more understanding of what the ark was it says make an ark of acacia wood now look at that acacia's name is in the bible i did not know that <laughs> acacia if you're listening to this i know sometimes you listen to these your name's in the bible all right and it's describing the ark of the covenant it says make make an ark of acacia wood a sacred chest three and three quarter feet long and two and a quarter feet wide and two and a half feet high. Overlay it inside and outside with pure gold and put a molding of gold all around it. Cast four rings of gold for it and attach them to its four feet. Two rings on each side. Make poles for acacia wood. No, make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Fit the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. These carrying poles must never be taken from the rings. They are to be left there permanently. When the ark is finished, place inside it the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Now that's the Ten Commandments. Verse 17, then make the ark's cover, the place of atonement out of pure gold. It must be three and three quarter feet long and two and a quarter feet wide. Then use hammered gold to make two cherubim and place them at the two ends of the atonement cover. Attach the cherubim to each end of the atonement cover, making it all one piece. Verse 20, the cherubim will face each other, looking down on the atonement cover with their wings spread out above it. Place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the ark of the covenant. From there, I will give you my commandments for the people of Israel. Now let's see, there's some commentary. There's commentary on this section. Verses, well, verses 10 through 27. We only read through... Um, verse 22 but let's go ahead and see um, what this says most sacred of all the furniture in the tabernacle was the ark in place of the idol that stood in pagan oh hold on I just in place of the idol that stood in pagan sanctuaries the Hebrews had a chest a beautiful chest to be sure but a chest nonetheless in that chest was a copy of their agreement with God they had no idol with which to manipulate God, but a reminder of God's gracious acts on their behalf and of their promise to commit themselves wholly to him. See the article, Ark of the Covenant. So now, <laughs> now I'm curious again. Okay, so I forgot to say my name. I'm Sheena Major. And I'm a life coach and I help people heal from relationships that have been unhealthy and I took on this challenge of reading every day reading through the entire New Testament and we are um, coming up on the 
on the very end where we're reading you know from revelation 15 today so on these read with me's i'm reading out loud and you're reading with me because i'm just going through the bible as if i'm just in my house which i am right now i'm in my bedroom just going through the bible so that's what this read with me is about so if this is your first time check out all the other books in the new testament we went through them all and I've learned a lot, I've grown a lot, and I trust that you will too. So now, I'm going down this rabbit hole because on the opposite side of Exodus 25, what I just read, there is an actual picture of the Ark of the Covenant, and it says the artist's conception of the Ark of the Covenant. So this is um, a, a drawing, but this is the description that we just read. So I'll post this picture for you. And now I'm curious to hear what this article has to say. So listen up. Here we go. Ark of the Covenant. Um, also known as the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the object most sacred to the Israelites during their time in the wilderness. Okay, so this is after they crossed the Red Sea. And remember, they spent all those years in the wilderness. It says, do we know what the Ark of the Covenant looked like? We cannot be positive, but there is a clear and detailed description in the Old Testament, Exodus 25, 10 through 22, and that's what we just read. Arch, who is this? Arche Eolo? I don't know. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. I'm looking at the wrong line. Listen, I'm sleepy. I'm not going to lie to you. I am tired. <laughs> The archaeologists have discovered depictions of the Ark. For example, a stone carving of the Ark was found at the excavation of a synagogue in Capernaum. Really? From the biblical account, we can determine these facts about its physical appearance. It was a box about 45 inches long, 27 inches wide and 27 inches high, made from acacia wood. Four poles were inserted into the rings on the side of the ark so it could be carried by four men. And then it says the illustration. The lid on the ark, called the atonement cover, was made of gold. Mounted on this cover were two winged creatures, called cherubim, which faced each other with outstretched wings. Inside the ark were the two stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments, which Moses had received from God at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. Now just imagine being Moses and receiving these stone tablets. And I, I just close my eyes as I'm thinking about this. Like, the stone tablets really were a thing. Like, it really happened. I just had to take a minute and reflect on that because it, you know, we read, we've been reading through this Bible and everything we're reading is so true. And we really have to keep this in mind as we're, you know, as we're considering ourselves and, and how we're, I don't know, conducting ourselves as Christians. I mean, a lot happened. 2,000 years ago for us to get to this point where we can sit and listen to a video. <laughs> it's like, my goodness. And we know we can never keep the commandments. We know the commandments are are there to show us, you know, that we need the Lord, right? The law. And, and they're just a mirror for us to see, like, we need Jesus because we can't keep any of the commandments. Alright, so that was my little spiel. Let me keep going. It also contained a golden pot of manna. Oh, I didn't know that. It also contained a golden pot of manna and Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves. And they, they take us to Hebrews 9.4. Reminders of God's provision for the needs of the Israelites in the wilderness. Okay, so the, the staff, Aaron's staff, and the manna was also in there as a reminder yeah and we we do need to remember god is our prov provider like the provision that he provided for the the children you know the israelites after crossing the red sea was amazing and 
a shame that some of them didn't make it and the trip took so long, but God took care of them. The manna, the staff, and then I even think about the, you know, the, the pillar of fire and the cloud in the day and in the night and how he just made, made a way for the Israelites. It says the Israelites believed that God lived among them in the tabernacle between the wings of the cherubim on the atonement cover. God spoke to Moses from this place during their years of wandering in the wilderness as they were being prepared to enter the promised land. And it takes us to Numbers chapter 7 verse 89. Now I'm curious because it said God spoke to Moses. Where is Numbers in this Bible? Let's see. Chapter 7, verse 89. Okay, Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 7, verse 89 says... Hold on, that's a, that's a long chapter. 89 verses. Oh, hold on, I've got to turn back one more page. All right, you got to take it. Now, you know you're just reading with me, so hold on. Okay, Numbers chapter 7, verse 89. Remember, this we said is the Lord. God spoke to Moses from this place during their years of wandering in the wilderness and from the tabernacle. And this is what said, Whenever Moses went into the tabernacle to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the ark's cover, the place of atonement that rests on the ark of the covenant. The Lord spoke to him from there. Wow. Oh, my goodness. There goes that yawn. Sorry. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. There's still a little bit more in this section. It says, The ark was carried ahead of the Israelites when they left Mount Sinai in Numbers 10.33 when they crossed the Jordan River to enter Canaan. And when they circled the walls of Jericho before the city fell. So the ark was carried ahead of the Israelites when they left Mount Sinai, when they crossed the Jordan River, and when they circled the wall of Jericho. Now, I never, I didn't pick that up. And I've read that story many times before the city fell. After many other travels, it was finally placed in Solomon's temple in Jerusalem only to disappear after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 BC. So, oh, that's sad. 586 years before Christ, um, the, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And that can be found in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 1 through 9. The ark served as a visible reminder of God's presence with the Hebrew people. The atonement cover, covered with gold, symbolized God's throne and his rule in the hearts of those who acknowledge him as their sovereign Lord. Oh my goodness. Yeah, the gold, the atonement cover covered with gold, symbolize God's throne and his rule in the hearts of those who acknowledge him as their sovereign Lord. And yeah, God needs to be the ruler ruler of our hearts. The sovereignty. That was really good. I like that. He's got to rule our hearts so you can heal family. He's got to. Or... You know, we're, we're going to get through life, but it's so much easier if we let the Lord rule and reign over us. <laughs> it really is. So that was really beautiful. So let's go back. So now we're heading back to chapter 16. And this um, section is talking about the bowls. Remember they said they poured out the at the end of 15 the angels had completed pouring out the seven plagues so I guess it's in these bowls so let's go ahead and read this the revelation of Jesus Christ verse 16 and the first section is called first bowl then I heard a mighty voice shouting from the temple to the seven angels now go your ways and empty out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth 
So the first angel left the temple and poured out his bowl over the earth, and horrible malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Oh dear. Yeah, remember we read about the mark of the beast? I think it was in chapter 14. Now the second bowl on the next section says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse and everything in the sea. So these bowls are, are the representation of evil is what it's looking like here. Now the third bowl, verse 4, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs, and they became blood. And I heard the angel who had authority over all water saying, You are just in sending this judgment, O Holy One, who is and who always was. For your holy people and your prophets have been killed, and their blood was poured out on earth. So you have given their murderous blood to drink. It is their just reward. And I heard a voice from the altar saying, Yes, Lord God Almighty, your punishments are true and just. Yeah, you see, God is going to judge. Now there's commentary for verse 3. Let's read it. It says, And everything is in bold. And it reads, This final series of plagues describes the full force of God's judgment during the tribulation. In chapter 8, verse 9, only one third of the sea creatures died. So this is the judgment. Oh, gosh. All right. So let's read about the fourth bowl. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God who sent all these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. There's now that is hard-headed on a thousand. That's ridiculous. You're still not going to repent after you're being scorched? It's like for some people, what's it going to take? Oh. Now the fifth bowl, verse 10, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness, and his subjects ground their teeth in anguish. Remember the scripture that says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Okay, so verse 11, And they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, but they refused to repent of all their evil deeds. And this reminds me of the plagues, you know, back in um, Exodus, you know, let my people go. And he, he, he would say, you know, he'd bring all these plagues to the land and he still wouldn't let the Israelites go. Oh. Verse, or no, the sixth bowl is chapter 12. It says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up so that the kings from the east could march their armies westward without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. These miracle-working demons caused all the rulers of the world to gather for battle against the Lord, on that great judgment day of God Almighty. Verse 15 is in red, so this must be the Lord talking. It says, Take note, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Bless all who are watching for me, who keep their robes ready, so they will not need to walk naked and ashamed. That's right. The Lord is coming back. He's, he surely is. We need to be ready. You know, we don't know when he's coming, but how do we be ready? We be ready because we're serving him every day. We're learning about him every day. We're, we're doing our very best to be like Christ, a little Christian. You know, being clothed in his righteousness and following hard after him and serving him and bringing glory to his name. Verse 16 says, And they gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place called Armageddon in Hebrew. Okay, so the commentary for chapter 16, verse 16, Armageddon is in bold, and it reads, The place of the final battle of history, a likely location, is in the plain of Astralion, including Megiddo. Okay, E-S-D-R-A-E-L-O-N and M-E-G-I-D-D-O. Now this is between Mount Carmel and the city of Jezreel. 
That's where they think this battle took place. This place had known war in the Old Testament times. And it says, see 2 Chronicles 35, 20 through 24. And the note on Zechariah. You can also see the city of Megiddo. Okay, maybe it's Megiddo. M-E-G-I-D-D-O. And they have a little um, breakout section about the city where they think this battle took place. So you know me, I need to look at this. And then there's a picture, a model of the walled city of Megiddo. I wish I knew how to say it properly. But before we look at that, let's go ahead and read about the seventh bowl. It says, then in verse 17 of chapter 16, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a mighty shout came from the throne of the temple in heaven saying, it is finished. Then the thunder crashed and rolled and lightning flashed and there was an earthquake greater than ever before in human history. Verse 19, the great city of Babylon split into three pieces and cities around the world fell into heaps of rubble. And so God remembered all of the Babylonian sins and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. Verse 20, and every island disappeared and all the mountains were leveled. There was a terrible hailstorm and hailstones weighing 75 pounds fell from the sky on to the people below. They cursed God because of the hailstorm, which was a very terrible plague. They're cursing God. They should be asking God to forgive them and repenting. My goodness. They're busy still not wanting. Good grace of the good Lord. My goodness. All right, so those were the seven bulls in chapter 16 so but before i end this reading for today i want to look at the city of megiddo i think that's how it's pronounced m-e-g-i-d-d-o and remember we read in the commentary they think this is the final battle place of armageddon so let us read and see what this says here megiddo a walled city in the carmel carmel mountains was the most strategic city in Palestine. And I'm going to put the picture up as well. Okay, it was a city in Palestine. Okay, so now that that name sounds more familiar than Megiddo. So Palestine is where Armageddon was taking place. All major traffic through the nation traveled past the city, making it an important military stronghold where many major battles were fought. Megiddo is first mentioned in the Old Testament as a site where Joshua conquered one of 31 Canaanite kings. Now you can find that in Joshua chapter 12 verse 21. During the period of the judges, the forces of Deborah and Barak defeated the army of Sisera at Tanak near Megiddo Springs. And I hope I'm saying those names right. And they reference Judges chapter 5 19. In spite of these minor victories, Megiddo did not become firmly occupied by the Israelites until the time of Solomon, who reconstructed the city as one of its storage cities. This scale model of Megiddo in the picture here shows that the original walls of the city were about 13 feet thick, and they were apparently enlarged and reinforced at selected points to twice its thickness and you can see in the picture like the wall wow Zechariah prophesied that great mourning would take place in the valley of Megiddo Zechariah 12 11. the fulfillment of this prophecy is to be at the end of time in the battle of Armageddon the word the word Armageddon means mountain of Megiddo in Hebrew at the end of of time God will destroy the armies of the beast and the false prophet and that's Revelation 16 13 through 16 that we just read and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will reign forever Revelation 11 15 and 19 16 so yeah and you know and that's why I say like everything that goes on in our life and happens we've got to keep this in mind like in the end, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will rule and reign forever and ever. 
and we'll be uh, we'll rule and reign with him when when he takes us you know home you know on that appointed day my goodness it just makes me hopeful it makes me hopeful and i think about all the things that i've been through in my life and like nothing compares to just i'm going to spend eternity with my lord so whatever has happened whatever's going to happen whatever my future's got for me i'm ready because why i serve the king of kings and the lord of lords who will reign forever and you do too yes you do you can heal family you know and i, I have to say if you if you're a believer if you're a believer you're going to rule and reign with the lord and if, if you haven't taken the time yet, just keep listening. We're not done with the New Testament yet. Keep listening. Keep hearing the word, reading the word, and wanting to know more about who this King of Kings is. And, um, and every knee will bow, I'm telling you. You'll, you'll fall in love with the Lord. The more, we, the more we read His word, the more we love Him. Amen. So that concludes our reading. For today and tomorrow we're gonna take chapter 17 and 18 18 um, is a little longer but we'll see you know there's no it doesn't look like there's any pictures or illustrations so we'll see what the commentary has for us and what we can dig into with some scriptures so that was fun right that was good um, gosh I just feel compelled to say if you don't know the Lord um, you can say a prayer like this. Just repeat after me. Father, I trust that you are who you say you are. Please come into my life and forgive me of my sin. Help me to walk with you and to learn more and more about you. And show me the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Something that simple. And you can join the family of God and our You Can Heal family as well. So thank you again for listening. Always, always remember that true healing begins with self-love. Why? Because God is love. This great, great God lives on the inside of you. All right, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.